You're listening to episode 83 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with functional dietitian Abigail Huber about the three root causes of IBS and how to determine which root cause is causing your digestive symptoms. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self-care to fuel your bigger God-given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and today's guest is extra special for a couple of different reasons. The first is that she is a member of my intimate high-level mastermind, And the other kind of random fun fact is that we actually went to college together. So we've known each other for, gosh, about 15 years now. And it's not something that I ever would have thought would come back to actually have us working together and everything. So it's so cool that we're reconnected in that way. So I can't wait for you guys to get to meet her. But before I introduce this guest, I did want to share about a special opportunity that's coming up for nutrition entrepreneurs, online business owners, anybody who is looking to start, grow, or scale an online business, especially in the nutrition and health space. My coach, James Wedmore, who is the leader of the mastermind that I'm in, is an amazing teacher, and he has an awesome training on how to get your first 100 leads, whether you're starting from scratch or you're just trying to get another 100 leads into your nutrition business to grow your business, to attract new clients, to really start getting paid customers. It's one of the best trainings that James has ever created, and he's giving it away for free. I've had so much great feedback about clients of mine who have gone through this training. We did this training a year ago. Gosh, I can't believe it's already been a year, but in May 2020, I led a group of people through this training. We worked on it together. I coached on it, and they all thought it was so incredible, so helpful, and something that really made a huge difference in their business. So James is running this free training again in 2021, and I'm also running a free coaching group with this training starting on May 17th, which should be the day that this podcast comes out. So if you want to join us, you can go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash 100 leads. That's 100-L-E-A-D-S. And you'll put in your information. You'll get invited to not only my Facebook group where we're going to run the coaching, but you'll also get invited to sign up for James's free course on getting your first 100 leads. It's a really robust program. It's honestly pretty incredible that he's giving it away for free when he could easily charge several hundred dollars for it, if not more. And I'm super stoked to be running another group through this training as well. We had such a good time last year. There was so many aha moments. The energy was awesome. And so I am just so excited to be able to do this again for 2021. Now, we only run this group once a year, so be sure to join now. This is not going to be available later. We're not keeping this going past the month of June, so you definitely want to get participating now. And so, like I said, you can go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash 100 leads, sign up, get in the group, get access to James's training. And we're going to start on May 17th. We'll be meeting weekly on Mondays at 4 p.m. Eastern to go through the content. I'll coach you on how to apply the content to a nutrition business. And by the end of the month, you'll have everything that you need to capture those first or next 100 leads for your nutrition business and get in front of people that actually want to buy your stuff. 
So I'm super pumped about that. Hope to see you there. And now we can switch over to introducing our guest for today. So today's guest is Abby Huber. Abby is an integrative and functional dietitian and owner of the private practice Above Health Nutrition. Integrative and functional nutrition works to identify the root cause of unrest in the body and develop a customized integrative treatment plan that addresses nutrition, lifestyle, supplementation, and comprehensive functional testing. Abby received her undergraduate degree from Gettysburg College, which is where I went, in the field of health and exercise sciences, continuing on to complete her graduate studies in nutrition at Simmons College. She has gone on to complete various advanced trainings in functional medicine, which included a mentorship with a functional medicine doctor and comprehensive immersion programs. Abby's an expert in digestive health, which includes IBS, SIBO, acid reflux, chronic constipation or diarrhea, and various other GI symptoms and concerns, as well as specializing in skin health through healing the digestive system for skin symptoms, which include eczema, rosacea, acne, keratosis pilaris, and other skin and gut health related conditions. She also leads speaking series and events for organizations and corporate wellness programs on a variety of health and wellness topics. Abby and I are going to be talking about IBS primarily today and just gut health in general and the reasons why you haven't necessarily got to the root cause of your gut issues and why doctors are so wrong when they tell you that IBS is a lifelong condition. Like I said, Abby's part of my mastermind and she has been working on this stuff for years and she is such an expert and I just love how she's able to break things down in a really simple way for people which is actually really a talent that not a lot of people have. So Abby does a great job of taking really complex topics and turning it into something that everybody can understand, which is why I love the work that she's doing, making all of this functional medicine gut health accessible for anybody who wants to learn. So I'm excited to have her on the show. It's really great to reconnect with her after 15 years of going to college together. And actually, we were in the same sorority together, which is another fun fact. So it's so great to have Abby back in my world. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to Abby Huber. All right, everybody. Well, I am so excited to have with me on the show today, Abby Huber. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast, Abby. Excited to be here. And as I mentioned in your introduction, we actually have known each other for, gosh, over 10 years at this point. What, what, we actually graduated more than 10 years ago, so it's actually been like 15 plus years. So it's kind of funny um, how we ended up reconnecting and being in this world of integrative and functional dietetics. It's uh, not something I think either of us might have been thinking about when we were uh, doing our sorority thing back in the early or I guess mid 2000s. Yeah. I didn't even find out what a dietitian was until junior year of college. And I was like, oh, well, guess I'm going to grad school. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Um, So for those of our audience that don't know you and want to get to know you better, I would love to just hear your story about how you got so passionate about nutrition and particularly gut health. Yeah. I guess it started in high school with just a love of food and particularly food that nourishes our body. I was always the friend in my friend group that was making the healthier cookies and maybe so much to a little extreme where I wouldn't put any sweetener. My friends would be like, oh, these are delicious. Then I'd find them shoved into the couches or something later at our school. And I was also a science kind of nerd. So when I really started to figure out that nutrition was kind of a beautiful combination of love of food and kind of food as medicine with a tremendous amount of science, particularly chemistry was my favorite. And it it came very kind of intuitively to me. So that really sparked my interest in kind of better understanding the body and how we can use food and lifestyle as tools to better support our unique bodies. I started to really figure out kind of the field of integrative functional nutrition when I started to realize that I was actually struggling with digestive symptoms, particularly I had chronic constipation and kind of the IBS world. And I actually didn't know that I had it for a while because I didn't know that it was abnormal to not go to the bathroom every day until I was actually shadowing underneath the functional medicine doctor and we were having a conversation and that came up and I was like, oh, well, first of all, I have to figure out, do I go to the bathroom every day? Because I've never really noticed. And then that really sparked 
the interest in gut health and through my own journey and then working with clients and really seeing that, oh, there there actually is a, a root cause that we can eliminate these symptoms and no longer struggle with this kind of anxiety of what's going to happen from the foods that we're eating and, you know, move it out the other end in whatever fashion. And it really, I think the discovery that digestion should really not be dramatic at all was a big discovery for myself because it certainly felt like something that was, you know, a daily or weekly challenge. So that's a little kind of snippet of how I found myself in this world. And it's been a wonderful journey. And I just now love to share that message and kind of educate and nerd out with all of my clients around it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of nuts to think that most people don't really even know that having a poop every day is what you should be experiencing. And if you're not experiencing that, then there's something probably not great going on in your gut. Cause I just feel like, I mean, first of all, it's not, I feel like dietitians, we just talk about poop and it's like no big deal. But when, you know, you're in your twenties and that's not something I remember talking about when I was in college. And so I feel like so many people probably have those symptoms. I mean, I think, what is it? IBS is like one in five people have a diagnosis of IBS and that's people that got a diagnosis, right? You got to think about all the people that just have that and never thought to go to a doctor about it because they don't even realize it's not normal. So it's kind of wild to me just to imagine how many people are dealing with these kind of symptoms and just either assuming that it's normal and that there's nothing wrong with that or that they've been told, oh, well, even though that's not normal or ideal, there's nothing you can do about it. So just get used to it or take the Miralax or something like that. Yeah. And I think a lot also, and I do a lot of education with with clients around your digestive system is so impactful in so many other areas of your body and your life from our mental health, such as anxiety and depression to our hormonal health. It's kind of how we excrete our exogenous hormones to our skin. So, so many of these things that, okay, maybe our digestive symptoms are like, "Mm, they're mildly annoying, but you know, they're fine. We've kind of figured out a way to like manage them, but yet we have cystic acne or we're struggling with some pretty debilitating anxiety or, or whatever these other things are. And those are the things that we're focusing on, but yet the root cause of those might be, are just mildly annoying digestive symptoms because it's the gut. So helping to, to really connect how integral the gut kind of environment is to so many other parts of our overall wellness, I think really surprises a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I saw so many people when I was working primarily with hormonal health where, you know, the actual gut issue is what was causing the, either the missing period. So amenorrhea or really bad PMS or anything like that. And it's just, again, because a lot of times either it's not severe enough that it's you know, the main focus, or they just have been told it's normal or just the way things are. It's like, they don't look at the gut as being the core issue. They look at the thing that, you know, is causing the most amount of discomfort or pain or embarrassment, whatever it is. And so, um, I know as, as you know, it's rare that you would work with somebody with a chronic health issue that doesn't have something going on in the gut. You know, maybe it's not as, dramatic, like you I love the word dramatic that you use. It might not be dramatic as somebody like going to the bathroom once a week, but it is something that I feel like it's unusual for somebody to have like perfect gut health, honestly. And I guess, you know, perfect is heavy air quotes, but even having generally good gut health, I think is actually a lot more rare, unfortunately, than it should be. And before we started recording, you and I were talking a little little bit about the belief that food is the main culprit behind IBS. So just to define, if people don't know what IBS is, it's irritable bowel syndrome. It's not technically a real diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's kind of like saying, we can't figure out what's wrong with you, so we're going to call it IBS. But I think most people believe that food is the trigger or the cause for IBS. So can you talk to that belief a little and why that might not be the best way to think about IBS recovery? Yeah. I find often that in my discussions with clients or interested anyone kind of in the digestive challenge arena, food is kind of thought of as the major tool in 
really, I would just say managing IBS. The idea that, well, and I hear this all the time from clients, just let me know what I can't eat and exactly what I have to avoid and not do and cut out and eliminate. And you know all of the language of, I will just manage for the rest of my life if I can just not have these digestive symptoms. And that's really what, what we're doing. We're just avoiding these foods that are actually feeding some of the environment or feeding, they are directly feeding the environment in the GI system. And when we take those foods out, for instance, FODMAPs, fermentable carbohydrates are um, particularly a category of foods that are talked a lot about in the IBS world. Avoiding many of those foods can decrease symptoms in certain individuals that are struggling with IBS. That being said, it is simply just a managed kind of a management tactic and elimination tactic. And it's pretty limiting in terms of the way that we can kind of enjoy foods. So when we think about, all right, well, what's really going on in, in a body with IBS and how do we actually eliminate from the very root cause, that's where we really come up with kind of the understanding that, oh, there's actually shifts in the environment. We're talking about the microbial environments, the organisms that live inside of the body. We're talking about the di digestive abilities of the body, stomach acid, enzymes from the pancreas, bile from the gallbladder. We certainly could be talking about inflammation, trendy term leaky gut, which is very legitimate. Intestinal permeability is a little more accepted of a term, but so there are deeper root causes. So food can certainly be a tool in a treatment protocol that can help to alleviate some of these larger symptoms while we get to the root cause, but it is unfortunately, or not unfortunately actually, but it, it is not a tool that we can use to fully heal a digestive system. And we should be able to, you know, a lot of those, for instance, those FODMAP foods, the fermentable carbohydrate foods, if anyone that looks at that list of foods, they're like, what avocados? Oh my gosh, like looking at these foods that are actually really nutrient dense foods, all the cruciferous vegetables and broccoli and cauliflower that are touted in the nutrition and wellness world is really significant foods, yet they're on this list, this forbidden list of foods. And you start to get the picture of, oh, well, if these are such bad guy foods, you know, in the IBS world, there must be something else going on because they're actually foods that are really important for our overall long-term wellness. So that's really where we get to eliminate the root cause of IBS and then open up the world of the foods that we can enjoy from the cruciferous vegetables to the avocados to whatever all those wonderful list of foods on the FODMAPs are. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when we when I first started getting more into the integrated and functional space with nutrition, it, there was a big emphasis on the elimination protocols. And something that I saw a lot was people coming to me that had already done these elimination diets and they just never got off them. And they were like, well, I, I feel a little better than I did, or maybe sometimes they didn't feel better at all. And they would be paranoid about, like you said, like broccoli or garlic, that kind of thing that, you know, not only as normal, like just food that people should be able to eat, right? Like it's, it's not like broccoli is something that you should be afraid to eat in most cases, but it's also something like you said, that there, there's so much nutritional and health benefit to those foods. It's not like it's, oh, I just can't have like donuts. Like, yeah, that's not like ideal because donuts are great, delicious, whatever, but it's not like your your health is going to suffer if you can't have donuts, right? V versus a lot of those like, you know, sulfur rich cruciferous vegetables, you know, the allium family, that kind of stuff that there are actual really significant health benefits of eating those. And so to just avoid them forever is probably not, you know, neither enjoyable because those foods taste good or actually beneficial for health. So I think that's something we talk about elimination diets gone wrong a lot on this podcast because I do think that unfortunately so many people use them inappropriately. It's not that they're bad or, you know, like you said, it's not like you're anti low FODMAPs or something like that. It's just, they're not a long-term solution and they're not really fixing anything. And they actually could cause problems if you just stay on it for months, years, rest of your life kind of thing. What do you think is driving the belief that IBS is a lifelong condition? Because I feel like that's kind of the mindset, right? Is, okay, I have IBS. If I don't eat these foods, it feels better. 
and I'm always going to have IBS. So that means I'm always going to have to avoid these foods. Where do you think that belief is coming from? I really find that unfortunately, a lot of my clients go to their general practitioner or even to their gastroenterologist and they get a colonoscopy or an endoscopy or a combination of both or whatever it is that they're looking at the physical organ system, which is a really important step. And we're always grateful when someone gets a clear colonoscopy and endoscopy and all of those things. I'm like, great, let's celebrate that. But after those generalized procedures, if they don't find anything concerning, it's very much, oh, well, you just have IBS and here's a low FODMAP list of these foods that you can avoid. And that's really the only conversation that's had of if it's even had, not, not all practitioners will even talk about those types of things. They just say like, oh, phew, it's just IBS, have a lovely rest of your life. So I find that there's a lack of education from kind of the conventional medicine world of that there is a ability to heal and eliminate that root cause so that someone doesn't struggle with these irritable bowel syndromes of this, these swings, these ebb and flows of GI symptoms. And a lot of the Google rabbit hole of IBS myths really feed into that. And um, being in the kind of digestive health world, it we do need some deeper tools to understand what is at play in someone's unique body that is driving those IBS symptoms because it's not always just one thing. There's generally three subtypes of kind of root causes of IBS, and that's kind of boiling it down to being really generalized there. But once we can understand what of those three subtypes, or maybe it's all three that are at play in someone's body, then we can start to really kind of eliminate that root cause. But certainly it takes a little bit more time. I've certainly been in this field, you know, along with you for studying it for 10, 15 years, going down that deeper rabbit hole and feel very, you know, confident and understanding, but Yet also, we're still learning leaps and bounds about the microbiome and the digestive system and all of these things. And I think that there's kind of a combination of that, that lack of knowledge about it and a little bit also of the definitive word from our general practitioner sometimes of saying that either I, heard, I have heard from many clients that they've been told point blank that there is no cure for IBS, unfortunately, or that food, well, this might be, but kind of the foods that they're eating maybe have nothing to do with it, or that they're, you know, really put into the belief that there is no long-term healing for IBS from many different avenues of education. And then that's really where, you know, I want to work to re-educate and kind of get on a platform and scream it from the rooftops that someone does not have to struggle the rest of their life with even mild GI symptoms, certainly extreme GI symptoms, um, but anywhere in between, we can absolutely get to the root cause of those. Yeah. And you mentioned that there's three general root causes that you've kind of collapsed down to make it a little bit more simple, which again, we know that there's so many different things that can play in. There can be multiple things going on, but how, how have you defined those three generalized root causes? The first root cause is digestive. I'm calling it digestive insufficiency. So essentially when someone's body isn't optimally excreting digestive substances. So a lot of the time that can be contributed from a number of different places, from even a lifestyle. We're racing through our day, eating on the go, being stressed, checking emails during meals, eating too fast, not chewing. All of these things can impede the communication between our brain, which is where digestion starts, and the digestive organs, which are where the digestive secretions, stomach acid, digestive enzymes from the pancreas, bile from the gallbladder, where all of those are produced. And it is really run in the nervous system on the rest and digest arm of our nervous system. So we do need to create a lifestyle shift around the way that we eat in order to optimally digest our food. So certainly it can be pieces of that. So that's one category, this digestion, kind of non-optimal digestion or digestive insufficiency. 
The second would be dysbiosis or GI infection. I know the word infection, sometimes people are like, that's very intense. But that's really talking about the microbiome, so the organisms that live inside of our GI system. And there can be kind of an imbalance in those, maybe even a lack of our good guys, potentially maybe too much of our bad guys or what I like to call bullies on the playground, the uninvited guests to your party. And they're the ones that are parking on your lawn and spilling red wine on your carpet. And they weren't invited in the first place. So we're really not fans of them. And they're causing a ruckus in there. There certainly can be kind of overt infections. So some big bad guys like parasites or even worms. I know people really don't like to hear that, but these are all things that we can identify, but we do need to know like who's in there, who are the uninvited guests that might be spilling the red wine on the carpet because we don't just want to kind of willy nilly treat someone's GI system for a pretty significant thing like that and have that maybe not be one of their root cause dynamics. Because we certainly want the intervention to match whatever root cause we're, we're going about. So that's the, the kind of the second of that dysbiosis or GI infection. And then the third would be inflammation. This is a little bit of a catch-all of a number of different things from, as I mentioned earlier, that intestinal permeability or leaky gut, which is a breakdown in the barrier system of the GI So what we get is an over-communication between the GI environment, and the GI environment is always chaotic. There's a lot of hustle and bustle in our GI system, and it's very open to our external environment. So that's normal and natural, but we want a really strong barrier system to keep all of that chaos contained. So when there's a breakdown in the barrier of the GI system, it starts to over-communicate with the greater body, the systemic body, the immune system, and we start to get inflammation dynamics. So we can certainly have GI symptoms from that. A lot of times bloating falls into that category. We can get GI pain, but we also can then get the worsening of anxiety. We can get skin conditions. We can certainly get aches and pains. We can get more of these systemic implications. We can also have more of a production of inflammatory chemicals in our GI system, protein markers that elevate, that are actually telling us that the actual organ system itself is inflamed. So that would be our third. There's a couple other pieces that can fall in there too. But so we really want to identify in someone's unique body, which of those three are that root cause. And then in those three categories, what exactly is really going on? Because then that really creates this like beautiful yellow brick road of, oh, we just get to follow this yellow brick road and kind of really narrows down the intervention that we're going to put in place to eliminate that unique set of IBS symptoms in that individual person. Mm Mm-hmm. Total side note, I'm loving all the visual metaphors. (laughs) I just, I'm such a nerd for that kind of stuff. So I love it. And it's interesting with those three areas of root causes, how many of them can like, you know, cascade, if that makes sense. And I'm even just thinking of as an example, like if somebody is really stressed and, you know, not eating well or eating in a appropriate manner, as far as like, you know, eating at your desk, shoving food in your face, like reading a stressful email at the same time, all of that. And then, so you don't get that stomach acid production if you're not really engaged with your food. And then if you're eating food that's like not really fully digest, that can throw off the balance of bacteria in your in your digestive system. And then when you start to get like, you know, the pathogenic overload, then that can create inflammation. And then inflammation can stress your body out. It's like just kind of nuts how it's like, because I, I feel like one of the things that I was always, well, not always, but very frequently asked is like, well, what cause this to happen in the first place? Because people are like, well, I don't get it. How did I get this dysbiosis anyway? Or how did I, you know, why would my pancreatic enzymes be so low? And it's just really interesting when you look at all the different factors, how it could almost be this like this one domino that falls that all of a sudden starts knocking over these other dominoes. And a lot of times when you do the testing to figure out the the root cause, it's like, okay, well, this domino is making the biggest problem, but it wasn't necessarily the thing that started this whole situation. Is that what you tend to see? Like something could, like dysbiosis could be the big domino, but it wasn't like they had some, you know, actual parasite or something. It was more of a chronic, you know, bacterial imbalance that developed from poor food habits or poor eating hygiene, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I like to call it the snowball effect that, you know, when we roll a snowball down a mountain, it starts at the top, but pretty small. And then all of a sudden, when it gets to the bottom of the mountain, you're like, this is a giant snowball that could plow me right over and is now a really impactful, negative piece of my experience in my body. And really peeling back that kind of chipping away at that snowball is really figuring out, okay, where, you know, what is the biggest, as you were kind of saying, like, what is the biggest piece of our puzzle, but also educating. And I'm very much an educator at heart. I feel for all my little animations in my brain, that's very much what happens in my brain. I'm like, Ooh, this is all the things that are happening, but really wanting my clients to understand exactly why we're doing what we're doing so that when they have, um, you know, when they sit down to a meal, it's really this understanding of like, oh, okay, I know exactly why I need to take a couple deep breaths before I take this bite and why I need to close out of my email and why I need to do even these simple, maybe seemingly some days annoying because you're like, but I have 10 minutes to eat. And I could also fire off this email at the same time. And, you know, our desire to be ever busy and ever productive so that when, you know, the digestive system is, is a, is a continuous system that is always going to ebb and flow based on, you know, if we have a really fun vacation somewhere and maybe we're having a little more cocktails than usual, or we're eating different foods and we might say like, Oh, I'm kind of feeling like bloated. And these things have, you know, that is not a a sentence of, Oh, you're going to be bloated forever now. But the idea of like, oh, okay, then I kind of know to come back down to my foundation. So we always start with the foundation of kind of what I like to call eating hygiene so that we can start to chip away at that snowball, the first little layer. And then we kind of see how that settles in someone's body. And if we're, okay, well, let's go a layer deeper and a layer deeper. And, and certainly sometimes we do get to the layer of, oh, there's an overt infection here now that that doesn't just need to be optimized through allowing the digestive system to do its own self-cleaning mechanisms because we do have a really brilliant, we are put together in a brilliant way. There was no mistake about it, but we do want to allow those systems to, to see, you know, what is the least intervention that we can make to allow this body to start to regulate itself. And that's where if we understand, you know, there is an overt infection, then, okay, we can do something about that too, but we only need to go as deep as we need to go. And sometimes it's really just eating hygiene and someone's like, I'm healed. This is amazing. And I always love when that's the case, but it's not always the case for everyone. Yeah. I mean, I feel like with eating hygiene, that's one of those things that it's not going to hurt anybody, right? Like, (laughs) I mean, there's nobody ever developed a health issue from taking the time to like sit and eat quietly and not be on their phone or on the computer. Right. So it's nice. It's nice when there's some interventions that are certainly not going to do any harm and most people could benefit from. I mean, I know that a lot of times I'm on my phone when I'm eating breakfast or something, it's, it's a very common bad habit. So I'll, I'll admit to that, but it's, um, it is something that most people just don't even realize it makes such a big impact. And I've seen the same thing where it's like just telling someone to make sure that they're chewing their meals. Like it sounds so basic, but when you're not paying attention, it's like, you're just inhaling your food and they realize like, oh, wow, if I just take an extra five minutes during my meal, 10 minutes during my meal to sit down and chew things thoroughly, it can make a huge impact, especially on symptoms like bloating. And, you know, and we know that whatever happens in the stomach then has a downstream effect on the rest of the intestinal tract. So it's like, it sometimes, I mean, I don't think it's, always that simple. Obviously, like you said, not everybody's like, I just chewed more and now everything's fine. Um, but it is kind of nuts how, and I feel like I'm keep saying everything's nuts, but you know, that's just the way the world is these days. And what I was going to say, it's just weird how we've just been so far removed from that as like a expectation of society that it's revolutionary to say, take more than five minutes to eat your lunch and don't do it while you're responding to emails kind of thing. Yeah, I think about it often as it's it's just it's not sexy. So no one's going to buy a magazine or click on an article or you know do the due diligence to read about how revolutionary chewing is. And you know, in my education, I start off with saying like, "Hey, today is not going to be the most exciting bit of information that we're going to go through, but I bet it's going to make a really big impact." And you know, really kind of combing through. Oftentimes, my clients are kind of like, "Oh my god, I never really." recognized how a digestion starts in the brain and that it's a hormonal cascade. And there's like really this quite involved network that is at play and really kind of reiterates the importance of those somewhat simple and unsexy interventions 
but there is really always some degree of relief. And I think of everything in the body as a volume. You know, if we're at a 10, maybe eating hygiene will take us to a nine or an eight, probably not to a zero if we're at a 10, but we could have some sort of relief. And then that opens the door to being able to kind of go again, chipping away at that snowball a little, a little bit more clearly of, okay, now that we've gotten that out, we see how impactful that is on this person's system. And then we can start to kind of go, go a little deeper, but yes, very much of our need from the Google and the clickability and the how am I going to make this headline as like sassy as possible? These types of eating hygiene don't typically get to the top of the list because we have control over them and we don't need to spend money to chew better. It's a free intervention. <laughs> well, and it's one of those ones that sometimes most people aren't even aware it's not happening because I mean, most people wouldn't think, oh yeah, of course I'm not chewing when I'm eating. Like there's, you assume you are if you're not paying attention to it. So if people start to pay attention and they're like, oh, wow, I actually do tend to swallow stuff before it's even like remotely broken down mechanically. It's, it can be really eye-opening because again, it's just like, why would you ever, why would you ever think you're not chewing? It's not like you're like, you know, literally swallowing an entire sandwich hole or something like that. So. Yeah. And that piece of like, it's really 15 to 30 bites, chews per bite. Um, Another, you know, more <laughs> colorful way to talk to, again, I have a lot of clients with IBS symptoms that are, you know, kind of tell me like, oh yeah, like if I eat kale, like I kind of see like full pieces of kale in the, in the toilet after. And my first thought to them is, you know, first discussion is to say like, well, if it's a full piece of lettuce that's coming out the other side, yes, there are probably some other pieces of the puzzle that we got to do some healing on, but like, how did that full piece of lettuce get down there in the first place? Like, we're probably not chewing. And that aside of, you know, corn, we're always going to see it on the other side, no matter how robust your digestion is. But there, you know, a little bit of, of kind of pushing it back on people to say like, well, it got past your only control, like you're di directly in control of chewing, which is pretty much the one of the more active parts that we have control over in digestion. So that piece of if, you know, if we are seeing some maldigested food on the other side, the first thing we should think about is, okay, 15 to 30 bites per chew, ooh, chews per bite, there you go, is really where, you know, some of that focus should be so that, you know, if there is some maldigestion happening, at least it's not happening because there are large particles of food that are confusing to the immune system as they get further down in the digestive system because they're really just not supposed to be there in such large particles. Yeah. Well, even if you take out the fact that, like, let's say somebody's digestion is actually working well, right? Like, so no dysbiosis or no significant dysbiosis and not a lot of inflammation. I mean, you're, you're just not even getting the micronutrients from your food if you're not chewing it, right? Like if something comes out, like a piece of lettuce or kale or something comes out completely undigested, like what was even the point of eating that, right? Like nothing was accomplished. You didn't get any nutrients out of it. You didn't really get the fiber from it. Nothing got, got utilized. So I even think just in general for people like maybe this, we'll just call this the episode about chewing with Abby Huber. Um, you know, it's it just, it's funny because it's like, I don't think people realize how many different systems it could affect. And it is such a simple change and it's very unsexy and it's probably annoying to have to do, right? And it's like, you have to probably completely change a lot of habits for it to happen. And so it feels like very, I don't want to say overwhelming, but it's like, oh man, like this doesn't seem like it's worth making all these adjustments to my way of living and my way of operating day to day. And it is something where if you think about like what else could be a downside of swallowing food whole or like not chewing it. And that is one of the things is that, you know, our food supply is already, you know, maybe not the most nutrient dense anyway. And then if you're not even digesting something because you swallowed it without chewing it, it's like, are you really getting any sort of nutritional benefit from eating those foods, especially like, you know, plant foods, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's one of these things where people I'm sure are like rolling their eyes. Like, are we really still talking about chewing right now? <laughs> but it is something that, I mean, I, I know if I'm someone who occasionally does not chew their food thoroughly because I'm trying to get too much done in a day, I can only imagine that people who are not 
trained in functional medical nutrition therapy, that they're probably not paying attention to it a ton either. And hopefully, if you guys listening take nothing else from this episode, you'll start chewing your food more thoroughly and kind of paying attention to, you know, do you actually chew it to a what is it supposed to be like a liquid consistency? I feel like that's what we were taught is liquid is ugh, sounds so gross, but it's like if it's not that consistency and you're swallowing it, it's like, well, what what problems could that be causing either in the short or the long term? Yeah, and I, I feel the longer I practice, the more I come back to this foundation. And and that really, when we think about the idea of functional medicine, that is probably 75% of the job of a functional medicine practitioner is to really help to reinforce these very fundamental everyday behaviors that we're doing. Because yes, we can do all the, again, sexy things that everyone that comes to a functional medicine provider maybe wants, like the personalized supplements and the, the parasite, maybe even, I feel like some of my clients, if we do find an infection, they're like, oh, thank goodness. Like that, you know, justification of, of all the things I've been struggling with, but we really can't do much if we don't have this foundation. And when we think about that saying, like, you are what you eat, there's truth in that, but not as much. It's you are what you absorb and assimilate into your actual cells. So if again, if we're not chewing it, we're not breaking down, we're not digesting it, well, we're certainly not going to be pulling it through our intestinal lining into our bloodstream and giving it to our mitochondria to make energy. Fatigue is a huge side effect of IBS. Not only is it a system, a GI system that is overwhelming, it uses 10% of our body's energy, caloric expenditure, probably more if it's dysfunctioning. So that's exhausting. But then also if you're having overt issues absorbing things, well, that's a much bigger issue that all of a sudden, and then it's kind of like, oh, what's the solve there? What's one piece of the solve is that chewing, slowing down. And I find a lot of times like when, you know, if we start talking about these, a lot of my clients, I think, and probably even people listening, like they want to hear about the high level, like sexy, interesting stuff. But then if we just start to end the podcast there, tell you all about the sexy high level stuff, it's kind of like, there's anxiety through the roof of like, well, how am I going to, how do I know if I have an infection and, you know, spinning out into all these things. When, if we start talking about some of these foundational pieces, it's kind of like, oh, you can do that for lunch. That's happening in 30 minutes. It actually, I find is so much more of a therapeutic intervention for people to feel more empowered in their everyday choices and behaviors that they're making. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like that's pretty much anything that any of us are trying to accomplish in any area of our life. Most of the time, it's the basics and the foundations and the consistency with those foundations that's actually going to move the needle. And I feel like we're, I, I feel somebody... I forget who this was, but somebody calls us like the microwave generation where it's like, we just want everything to happen really fast and we don't want to put a lot of work in and, you know, we want to see results immediately. And that's just not the way the world is generally. I mean, yeah, sure. There's shortcuts you can kind of take to make things happen faster. Or as you were mentioning before, like if somebody has an infection, you probably don't want to like wait for the body to like figure it out and take care of it itself, especially if it's been going on for a long time. But it is something where I feel like people have this mindset that things, if they do everything the way they're supposed to do it, that it should be fast, it should be easy, it should be like immediate results, and it should be something that like looks really impressive as far as the actual actions. And I just feel like the more I'm in not only the health space, but also like the entrepreneur space, it's like, that just isn't the way it works. And I think the faster people can realize the small actions that you do on a daily basis have just as much impact, if not sometimes more, as the big rocks that you move, that is something that I feel like most people need to kind of understand and grasp so that when they are taking the steps that they need to take for gut health or whatever else they're dealing with, they actually don't blow past those foundations and say, well, I'm just going to go straight into the supplement protocol and do a parasite cleanse and like, you know, do a little FODMAPs, SCD diet and all the things that look like really aggressive and just skip all the stuff that actually might've been the reason they developed the problem in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like we could talk about chewing for probably an hour and we're not going to because people will shut this off. So I'm going to move on. (laughs) But so if you wanted to share just a couple of next steps as far as what 
if somebody's dealing with any of those root causes and they don't know what the root cause is, like they're assuming that there's at least one, if not more, what would be their next steps for finding that root cause and then, you know, dealing with it once they figure it out? Yeah, these are where the tools of functional medicine really differentiate the way that we can approach IBS. And I find a functional GI test, a functional stool test, um, to be really the most optimal way that we can better understand what those unique root causes are in that individual's body. It certainly is an investment working with a provider and utilizing some of these functional testing. But I often find that clients come to me, you know, as a part of their journey, and they've been on the journey typically for years and trying intervention after intervention, eliminating foods, doing all of these other pieces. So really what you're investing in is this kind of clarity and efficiency in understanding what your unique body is really going through and is at the root cause of these IBS symptoms. So then that really can outline what are the exact unique pieces that are a part of this puzzle for this individual. And that's where we can personalize the interventions, be it definitely some nutrition interventions, um, certainly some lifestyle interventions, but definitely some targeted supplement protocols to really help to target those unique root causes and help to reverse them, help to heal them, help to really allow the digestive system to reestablish its own enclosed system where everything is optimally working because our digestive system is meant to be a very quiet, non-drama system. And that's really what we're, we're looking to get that person back to. So we want to figure out what are the barriers to that optimal function. And those are those three root causes of IBS and the kind of iterations that fall within each of them. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are running a program. I think the day this comes out, you're probably starting it relatively soon, but I know that the program that you run covers these three root causes and helps people get testing. So do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes, I do. I'm very excited. So it is called the No Drama Digestion Program, and it's a 10-week program that I've poured everything that I do in my one-on-one -on -one practice of eliminating IBS for my individual clients into this group program. So it really walks the group through the step-by-step -step process of eliminating IBS. It, it does include a functional GI test. So each individual gets to identify what their unique root cause of IBS is. There's a one-on-one -on -one piece of a session with me to review those functional GI test results and to personalize the protocol, supplementation, individual pieces for each individual in the group so that we're able to not only do the general practice of, yes, the eating hygiene and the lifestyle pieces, but then also have that individual component in a group model so that we can really move the needle. There is group coaching as part of that, kind of a weekly group coaching so that we can troubleshoot, navigate, better educate, kind of clarify all of those pieces for to feel really supported and kind of healing that IBS dynamic and really helping to understand the why we're doing everything and create a toolkit so that as someone goes through that healing journey, because it's a 10-week program, but realistically, when I work with my one-on-one -on -one clients and when I kind of educate to this, really saying, you know, the digestive system from a symptomatic standpoint can change very quickly. We can start to feel relief of digestive symptoms within probably about like a month to three months, we can feel a huge turnaround 180 in those symptoms. However, a full healing of a digestive system, I really like to give it a full six months to a year. You don't need to be working one-on-one -on -one with a provider for that entire duration. But that's really where we keep up these kind of foundational pieces. We keep up with some of the kind of individual personalized supplementation, things like that. So the 10-week program is really set up to build the roadmap so that someone feels confident and comfortable in really navigating that six months to a year of healing for themselves so that they 
don't have to come back and see me again is always the goal. And I say that with my one-on-one clients. And I say that in my kind of group program, the goal is for you to really understand how the digestive system works fundamentally, how yours is uniquely maybe challenged at this one period in time, how we're going to heal it, and then how you're going to stay in that healed body and maybe navigate in a little blips on the radar. And it's really going to be, I'm so excited for it. And it really is a wonderful opportunity for me to take the work I do in my private practice. And I'll really allow more people to have access to it is, is really ultimately the, the reason for why I'm doing the program. So May 18th is the official launch day. That'll be when the program kicks off. So if there are, I'm only taking 10 people for the first round of it. It's going to be a nice intimate group. Certainly if there are any still open spots on May 17th, we could squeeze somebody in, maybe even make an exception and edge it out to 12 people. That absolutely is, I'm open to that as an option, but very excited. A couple of slots have been scooped up already. So really looking forward to uh, supporting this group. Awesome. Well, and I really love the hybrid model that you're doing. I know, um, so Abby's in our mastermind and there's a couple of the practitioners in that group doing these hybrid models because one, they get so bogged down by like a wait list of one-on-one. It's like, well, if you want to work with me, we're going to have to, you know, start in three months. And most people don't really want to wait three months, you know, especially if they're in a lot of discomfort. And then also something I really love about the hybrid model is I feel like when you're working with somebody one-on-one, and I've experienced this, like I haven't done a lot of health stuff recently, but even with business coaching and stuff, you almost like can't absorb everything from a one-on-one session. And yeah, it's great to get your questions answered and it's great to like get personalization. And that's why I love the one-on-one component. But if you're just trying to learn and you just want to understand things better, it's like you almost get so much from a one-on-one that your brain can't even handle it. And then you end up not really learning the level of stuff that you really need to make it a long-term solution. And so that's what I really love about these kind of group one-on-one hybrid programs that you, like you were mentioning this program that you're launching, because it's that best of both worlds where you get that personalization, the one-on-one, and then you also get access to the educational piece in a group setting, in a, in a recorded setting. So that way, you know, if you're like, what did she say about pancreatic enzymes? I want to go back and watch that part again. It's like you get the opportunity to, to learn stuff because most people, and even like I said, a lot of what I'm learning lately is business stuff. I don't always get it on the first time I hear it, right? Like you kind of have to hear stuff multiple times. And even like coaches that I work with, I listen to them all the time. Like I will literally listen to a thing. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've heard this guy say this 10 times already in the last three years, but I'm going to hear it again because it's really helpful to get the, uh, you know, the repetitive information. And so that's what I love about these programs is that you can help people actually really solidify their understanding and not just turn it into this, like, well, anytime I'm not sure I need to like go have one-on-one time with Abby because like, that's my only option. So I just love seeing people creating these kind of programs and services. Cause I think ultimately, like, again, we said what one in five people with IBS, there's no way that you can help everybody at a one-on-one level. It's just not even possible. And so having the opportunity to start reaching more people, serving more people, helping more people, getting the information that they need that they're not getting from their, you know, their GI doctors and more conventional uh, medical practitioners. It just allows them to to absorb the information at a pace that I think is going to benefit them for a much longer period of time than if they're showing up on a one-on-one trying to absorb everything. But then the minute the call's over, she's like, they're like, wait, what did she say about that? I don't totally remember. And you just can't, you you can't always capture it, right? Like it's just not always possible to remember everything that somebody said in a, you know, 30 to 60 minute appointment. So anyway, that was a little bit of a side note, but I just, it's so exciting for me to see the the programs you guys are making. Cause again, it is, this is such a big issue that so many people deal with and the testing and the individualization and stuff is so important. And it's going to be great to have that opportunity to really learn and understand what you're actually doing and not just, you know, get this list of supplements from someone and say, well, I, I guess I know what I'm doing. I don't really know why I'm taking these. And that that's where I think your, your program is going to be able to fill those gaps in for people. Yeah. And I feel a lot about, um, with my one-on-one clients that 
you know, IBS is not dinner conversation for the most part. Um, I mean, unless you're a dietitian, I'm pretty sure at our mastermind retreat, we talked about poop a lot. So unless you're weird like us. <laughs> oh, my brother is always like, are we talking about poop again? Like, yes, we are. It's so important. But yes, I'm, I'm sure it's not at many people's tables. And so, you know, having a community that is all kind of in a similar situation having had similar struggles and similar wins that will, you know, be part of this program, I think is, is a huge component of healing in, in understanding I'm not alone and that there is ebbs and flows to my improvements. And then there are other people that are here to support me in everything from the actual tangible steps that we're going to take and implement to that emotional piece of, of the coaching, not only from me, but, but from one another in, in the group program as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. It's I'm obsessed with group programs. It's something, I just feel like you can't recreate that in real life, unfortunately, in most cases. And so it's something that I think is a positive of the way that our world is so connected online now. Well, if you guys are interested in learning more about Abby's program, if she still has spots left by the time this episode is out, you guys can go to episode 83 on lauraschoenfeldrd.com and you can hit the podcast tab and we'll have the link to that in the show notes. And if people are listening a little later and they're like, oh, darn, I missed it. How can they connect with you to learn more about the work that you do or maybe join a, a version of the program in the future? Yeah, I do a lot of education on Instagram. Above Health is my IG handle. And I will be running the No Drama Digestion program two times a year. So definitely if you miss out on the first launch, it will be launched many more times, hopefully, and helping many more people. I do have a one-on-one -on -one practice if someone is interested in a little bit more of kind of an intensive one-on-one -on -one situation. So I think the best way to probably reach out to me is through Instagram. Certainly visiting my website, abovehealthnutrition.com is another place to reach out to me. And I'm doing 15-minute discovery calls for the No Drama Digestion program. So if this piqued your interest and you're just curious to learn a little bit more and see if you're a good fit, then we can jump on a phone call and see if it feels like the right fit for you. Amazing. Well, Abby, it was so fun to talk to you about chewing and <laughs> poop and all the fun things that us dietitian weirdos are talking about on a regular basis. And I'm super pumped to see the group that you're taking people through. I think it's going to be amazing. I've seen a lot of the behind the scenes building work that Abby's been doing over the last few months. And my clients and especially my mastermind clients put so much energy and thought and, and, you know, there's so much work behind the scenes that goes into the development of these programs because ultimately designing a group program is a lot different than a one-on-one -on -one and taking the years of one-on-one -on -one experience and figuring out like, what do people actually need and what order do they need it in and how much should I give them so that they can actually learn without feeling overwhelmed? Like it's really pretty incredible how much energy and thought and, and thoughtfulness goes into these programs. So I'm so excited to see what happens with your first group that you lead through. And I uh, can't wait to see all the transformations that it, are experienced. Well, anyway, guys, thanks for hanging out with us for the last 45 minutes to an hour. We'll put Abby's links in the show notes for this episode. And we will look forward to seeing you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Are you a nutrition entrepreneur looking to grow an audience of people who will actually buy your programs and services? Then keep listening because I have a special limited time opportunity for you to get coaching from me and my top level business coach on how to attract a hundred of the right prospects for your nutrition coaching and consulting business. If you're looking to build a profitable, sustainable nutrition business, it doesn't matter if you have a brick and mortar practice or an online business. The fact of the matter is all successful dietitian and nutritionist entrepreneurs know that in order to have demand and desire for their paid offers, their free content has to create that demand and desire. But unfortunately for most, they go about this process backwards. And no matter how big their list size, they hear crickets every time they try to sell something to anyone. I've been there myself and I get it, it is beyond frustrating. But what if I told you that there was a surefire way of building an audience who not only craves your content, but literally begs you for it? That all of the hard work you put in can actually start paying off with sales and clients. 
And what if I also told you that you only need 100 subscribers to make it happen? Inside this free training from my expert coach, James Wedmore, you'll discover why traditional list building strategies don't work and just leave you spending months creating a bunch of free content that no one ever sees, or worse, attracts people that never want to invest with you. When you complete this free training, you'll start building a list that's literally going to be banging down your door to buy nutrition coaching and consulting services from you. Now listen, I've been working with James since 2018, starting with his incredible online program, Business by Design, and now as a part of his Performance Mastermind. And there's no one in the world of online business who I trust more to provide simple and effective action-oriented content to learn how to become a digital CEO and grow a successful online business. I absolutely love every piece of training he puts out and his free course on getting your first 100 leads is one of the best ones that he's ever done. And he's giving it away for free. Not only that, but as an extra special bonus, I'm running a live coaching group for five weeks starting on May 17th, where we'll go over the content from his training together and I'll help you apply it to your nutrition business specifically. Between James's incredible teaching and my nine years of experience running and growing an online health and nutrition business, we'll help you get those 100 high quality leads faster and easier than ever before. To join us for this limited time free training and coaching experience, go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash 100 leads, that's 100 L-E-A-D-S, and register now to grab your spot. I only run this free group once a year. So now's the time to join and learn everything you need to know about building a list of qualified nutrition clients quickly so you can have the profitable and successful nutrition business of your dreams. Go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash 100 leads and register now. And I'll see you in our free coaching group.